I'm going to just run through a couple of the key issues, and this is really just scratching the surface, um, following on some of the things that Ian raised, about you know, the things that we really just don't know. One of the most interesting things and damning things from my perspective, um, because I'm not really a kind of physical evidence guy, is the issue of the alleged 9-11 hijackers and, and the identity of the hijackers. And there's a paper that's been published um, in Research in Political Economy, which is another peer-reviewed journal, which is very well known, um, by the, the author is Jay Kolar, who's a video analysis expert. Um, and this, was the, this was, paper was published in a special a 2006 edition, which the whole thing was dedicated to 9-11, very similar to this one that's just come out. And uh, Kolar documents from multiple news accounts that many of you are probably familiar with that at least 10 of the uh, individuals named in the FBI's second and final list of 19 hijackers have turned up and been verified to be alive. With proof positive, at least one other hijacker, Ziad Jara, had his identity doubled and therefore fabricated. Now, Kolar also reviewed video uh, evidence, and he is a video analysis expert, um, which was furnished by the government to support its narrative. And this included footage of the hijackers at Dulles Airport and the infamous Osama bin Laden confession tape. And he found them to be riddled with impossibilities and anomalies, and he basically concluded that they're just totally unreliable. There's evidence of, of cutting, manipulation, all kinds of things. And he just said, look, we can't accept these. They're most likely to be either forged or something else, or they've been tampered with. Um, although the FBI officially confirmed, uh, it was in, in uh, late October, I think they confirmed, late uh, November they confirmed, that they, they said they actually verified the identities of the hijackers, absolutely, because there was some controversy about this. There was a report in Newsday in October, just before the statement was released by uh, Robert Mueller, saying that actually a number of officials had conceded that several alleged hijackers may have stolen their identities. And there were court records filed by the FBI that showed that six of them swore to false information to obtain photo IDs, which they then used to board the 9-11 flights. So that's in the public record. So even though, I mean, there's a lot of 9-11 de debunking sites which kind of say that, well, this issue is actually being, it's a dead issue. It's not a dead issue. It's actually something that's it's just, it's not being dealt with. There's an, a lot of other reports based on journalistic investigations and eyewitness testimonials which provide a very bizarre picture at odds with the conventional portrayal of the hijackers as Islamist fundamentalists. According to US investigators, five of them, including Mohammed Atta, visited Las Vegas at least six times between May and August 2001. And so one of the reports says they engaged in some decidedly un-Islamic sampling of prohibited pleasures <laughs> in America's reputed capital of moral corrosion. And you know, it goes on drinking, alcohol, gambling, visiting strip clubs. What's interesting, even Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who's described as 9-11 mastermind and the Al-Qaeda icon, reportedly met associates in karaoke bars and giant go-go clubs filled with mirrors, flashing lights, and bikini-clad dancers. And you know that, that kind of stuff goes on. There's lots of these reports. And the 9-11 Commission just didn't bother investigating what these mean. I mean, how, how could these guys who, I can, you can understand maybe at a very low level, kind of people who are kind of interested in something, maybe becoming radicalized and, you know, they've got a checkered history. But people who are very senior, like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was supposed to be very, very close to Osama bin Laden, part of this very strict Salafist, Wahhabi, puritanical trend. What were these guys doing, cavorting with, you know, in Las Vegas? Very strange. The other interesting thing is that Robert Bayer, the, the well-known CIA veteran, he actually wrote um, and it, that there was some evidence that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed may have been protected by the CIA because in 1997, um, this was shortly after he, he was working as a terrorism consultant in Beirut, uh, he had conversations with a, a police chief in, in, in Doha who said to him that, um, that they, they had been monitoring various cells in Qatar and uh, Muhammad, uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was one of the key members of this cell, and he was concerned that these guys were involved in planning a, hi a, hi a hijacking operation of commercial jets. And um, Bai actually sent this information to the CIA counter-terrorist center, and he said that there was absolutely no interest. And even years later, after 9-11, Bai took the same information about uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed to the Justice Department after the murder of Daniel Pearl, which he was implicated in, and again, he said there was absolutely no interest. So why, why was there this inexplicable lack of interest in, in this guy's, um, what this guy was doing? And so this kind of stuff, you can go on. I think I, I need to stop very shortly. 
There's one, I think the one, the one thing I want to kind of add and close on at this point really is how we address these issues in terms of the issue of Ian was saying about is it an inside job, is it not an inside job, where do we stand, blah, 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 blah. I mean, for me, I think the issue of, of this kind of binary kind of divide between, you know, did the Bush administration do it, did Islamist terrorists do it, and there's lots of questions about Al-Qaeda and Islamist terrorists, which, you know, we'll probably talk about in the, in the evening session. Um, this, for me, this, this divide is an artificial one, and it's, it's, it's a construct which has been created by the very thing that you have. You have conspiracy theorists, and then you have people who are against conspiracy theories. You have so-called truthers and so-called debunkers. This is just this is the whole thing. We need to come out of this, this constructed divide and focus on, in, in my view, focus fundamentally on what we know and ask really hard questions about, about those issues. Because we, because it's, a, it's clear that we, we cannot establish a paper trail on either side. We can't really prove, it's clear that the government hasn't really proved its case about the hijackers, for example. They haven't proved their case about Osama bin Laden, clearly. We haven't also been able to prove a case. There's no paper trail which says that this particular individual gave an order on this day that allowed the planes to blah, blah, blah. We have no way of establishing that. But what we can do, is build up a picture which establishes that what, we, what, what we're supposed to be told is, is mean absolute truth, which is now underpinning this whole narrative of, of the war on terror, just does not stand up to scrutiny. It's completely false. And that leaves us in a state in a complete limbo where we really don't know. But I think it's, it's admitting that we don't know is, is for us is, is a strength. And it's, it will undercut the statements of the debunkers who kind of focus very much on very specific theories and they say, well, you, you, you accept this theory and you say that theory and you say that theory and they're all wrong. But we're much stronger if we focus less on those particular interpretations and focus on, on the contradictions and anomalies.